there are a lot of ways we can look at the topic of judges, right? We recently have been involved, famous, uh, famous uh, case, Roe versus Wade. We can turn to even the U.S. government and their court system. You know, see, we can appreciate, you know, all this idea of a, a system of courts really has its root in Hashem's idea of how to form a proper society. Okay, even preceding the giving of the Torah and, and the Jewish nation, which is called a wise nation in the eyes of the world because we were given a Torah with so many laws, civil laws, ritual laws, and we became an example for for really the entire world system today of different, anywhere you go, there is an aspect of Jewish law in their court system because th that's really where it is all rooted in, is in, in the giving of the Torah and the civil laws of the Torah, and that spread worldwide. This is actually an opinion of the Ramban. Nachmanides says this, uh, you know, right, outright in his comments on the Chumash. But even preceding the, the Jewish nation and the giving of the Torah, there was always a commandment to have civil law a system of, 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 of a, judicial, a judicial system to help a, a society function properly. This is actually one of the, the seven mitzvot b'nei Noach. And even preceding Noach, it was already given to Adam and society before Noach to have a system of laws in order to have a society that functions harmoniously with, with peace, and with rules, with, with, with standards, proper standards. We, we see, the, the unfortunately, the reverse of this. When you don't have a proper system of, uh, of law that a, a society, a city, a country follows, you, you have chaos, you have anarchy, you have the worst things can happen. And we see this in the story of Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of a preferred, perverted justice system. Okay, so, it's, so this idea of shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha, judges and officers we, to place for different cities, countries, this is a something that's core to our existence. Core. Without it, we can't survive as a people. We would, we're already similar to the animals enough with you know, people killing each other, the person swallows up his neighbor uh, whole because he, he, just, he has no concern for his fellow human beings. So we already see that we can resemble more animal than human sometimes. That's with a court system. But without a court system, we would be, we, we, we would be lost. Okay, so... <clears throat> With that, I want to focus on an interesting twist, though, a shift in language. We say in the Chumash here, which is really the main pasuk that talks about, the main verse that talks about a, a court system that we're required to set up, it says that we must have judges and officers. And so let's appreciate the correlation between a judge and an officer. What's the idea of having a judge and an officer? So Rashi, right on the spot, helps us. He's saying things that are very sensible, that we don't need you know, the, the, the secular world will also acknowledge that if you have judges sitting in their black robes, which in some cases, like we said, you know, they could be more like cl a clown suit. You know, just give them a nice red, you know, red nose that you could squeeze that uh, make a nice horn sound. Because some of the judges out there are are acting and thinking more like clowns than judges. But when you have a real judge that is that sees straight and sees truth, especially a panel of them, so then you have you have decisions that we must listen to that we. We must respect because they're speaking words of truth, and especially if it's a if it's a court like the Sanhedrin, then they're revealing to us the divine will. They're telling us and showing us in their uh, legal rulings what God wants, how God sees this world, this perfect world, the way it should run. So it's very deep, very very important. That's why the sages compare judges to Hash, to, to Hashem in a way that, they, where that judges that properly judge and come to true rulings become partners with Hashem in creation. That is a teaching that, a very important teaching that we find in Parshat Yitro, that when three judges sit down, and certainly the Sanhedrin, the great uh, assembly of, of, of rabbis, when they judge properly and correctly, then they become partners with God in creation because they help extend the divine will, clarify it, and direct it to proper legal uh, criteria. We have exactly how and what we need to do to make a, a, a world where Hashem is present because the, the ideas and the ways he had in mind for us to live are here in the world with us. And when we have, unfortunately, the opposite, a system of judges like Sodom and Gomorrah that, that make rules that are contrary to what God wants, so you have a society and a city that needs to be destroyed by Hashem ultimately because there's no place for Hashem there anymore. Okay? 
But more to our focus right now is on the, the, the correlation between the judges and the officers. Since we live in a, in, in, a, in a less than perfect world, and since we, each of us ourselves, are not so perfect, we don't always want to do the right thing. We don't have an intuition always to do what Hashem wants. Every idea that comes through our mind and in our, in our heart doesn't necessarily fit with what Hashem wants. So we can't really rely on ourselves and think whatever I feel is what God wants. No, that's, that's senseless and foolish. So what happens is there could be a difference between what I want and what God wants. So when the judges are sitting and, and coming up with, with correct uh, ideas of how to follow Hashem properly and how to create a society that is doing what Hashem wants, sometimes the people will not want to follow that. They want to, they'll want to do what they want. And there's why you need officers. Meaning it's not enough to have judges. Judges can say whatever they want. But in the end, if we don't listen, so they don't have the power to, to compel us to follow their decisions. Right? Uh, if looking at it through the lens of a human being, I can have a lot of ideas that run through my mind. I can think to myself, oh, it would be great if I get up early tomorrow and pray early so I can take my time and pray properly. And when it comes to the next morning, instead of getting up, I roll back over and hit, because I say, oh, I have another half hour to sleep. And then I run to, to pray late, and I race through my prayers. And I, and I could have had a much better experience, but I chose to do otherwise. I didn't choose to follow what my mind told me. I chose to follow what my, my body was screaming to me in the morning. No, 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 I want more sleep. Similarly with the society. The, when the people don't follow the judges, so things won't work the way they need to work. So therefore... The judges need an extension is like the long hand of the, of the law. The, that's an expression in America. They need officers that can then go out further into the, and, and compel the people to follow the laws. Encourage, compel, you know, everything should be done in obviously the most peaceful manner possible. But yes, that's why without judges, I'm sorry, without officers, then in a sense there is, the, the judges don't have their full power and effect on society. So you need judges and officers. Without officers, this whole thing doesn't work. Doesn't work properly. Okay, so that's the correlation between judges and officers. And I hinted to a personal lesson that we can take from this whole idea of judges and officers in that I need to be a judge for myself. But I also need to function as an officer for myself. You know, there's a, today a modern terminology, life coach. I need to be my own life coach in the idea that I must come try to compel myself to do those things that I know I should be doing instead of ignoring them. And that's the idea of the, the judge and officer within me. Okay? Very important. But back to our main case, I want to focus on an, an interesting shift in the language to another place. If we take a look at the Shemona Esrei that we daven every, every day, hopefully, you know, three times a day, four times a day on holidays and Shabbat, but we don't actually, on Shabbat and holidays, we don't say this prayer. There's a prayer in our Shemona Esrei in the weekday one. I mean, so it's only three days a week, three days, three times a day. So in our weekday davening, there's a blessing that talks about judges. Everybody here familiar? Anyone here familiar with that blessing? So it comes up in the 18, within the 18 blessings that we say in, in our Shemona S, right? There's a prayer for judges. It's a prayer to re bring back the judges of old. Now, a big question is brought. Um, in this particular case, I saw it from the Lubavitch Rebbe brings this question, but it's probably a question that, that, that other rabbis also point out. Uh, it says in our prayer litur liturgy, it says to return our judges and our advisors. And there is no mention of police in that blessing. If you pass me the sitter, I'll, we can look at it inside. Thank you very much. So the question that we're going to present right now is how come in the, in the Shemona Esrei prayer when the rabbis decided to put in a, a prayer specially for judges, why doesn't it follow the pattern of the verse we have in the Torah that requires judges and officers. Why does this blessing say over here, I'll say it in English and then Hebrew, restore our judges as in earliest times and our counselors as at first. In Hebrew it's, Hashiva shoftenu kebarishona, bring back our judges like they were in the beginning. Ve'yo'atseinu kebatchila, and our advisors like we once had at first. So that's the question right now, let's make sure we got it. So. Why do we pray for judges and officers in the Chumash? Not pray, but why does the verse mention judges and officers in the Chumash? And why when the Shemona Esri, that we, when we ask for to have a, a proper system of judgment with the Sanhedrin following Hashem's rules, why don't we ask again for judges and officers? Why do we ask here for judges and advisors? 
okay, that's not incorrect that judges do need advisors, but, but here we're saying that we, the people, need judges and advisors. So that's the, 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 the simple level is that we're asking for judges and advisors, and the big question is, why are we not asking for officers, a policing of the, of the legal system? That's the question. Same, same thing here. Why are, here are we asking for alter leaders, just parts to alter both. All right. Well, well, based on my introduction, we'll appreciate for a bit further, I'll, I'll answer. Based on what I said earlier, that judges without police is essentially like not having judges. And that's what Rashi points out on this verse, that why is it shoftim v'shotrim? Why do we need both? Because if you don't have people to enforce the law, then it's as if you don't have the, the full power of the law. So we don't have the same question with judges and advisors because we can have judges without advisors, but we can't have judges without a policing of the rules that they create because a society that doesn't really intrinsically want to follow all of the rules won't follow them if they don't want. So it, when, when in a case where people don't want to listen to the judges, you need police. So that's the big question. Why, why, do we, why, in, the, why in the Shimon Esri are we, are we not asking for the system that seems to be necessary for the whole thing to work properly? That we need judgment, we need rules, but we need also, when things are not running right, we need people that might compel us and kind of encourage and bring the society to follow those rules. So if there are no consequences to our actions, then you'll see what's a deterrent for theft if I get caught and I have to pay more than I tried to steal, so then that will deter me from trying to steal. But if there's no, if, if there's no penalty for a crime, so what's going to stop people from committing crimes? taking advantage of people in business. What will stop them if there are no consequences, negative consequences? So we need police. In the society that we live in, we need police. So anybody have an idea uh, uh, of how to answer this? In, a, a, a judge in law can't be like a just or, or have, I don't know how to word it, but they can't, they're not always, they're not always going to make the right decision or they might get carried away with their power without an advisor. The same thing in, I mean, you can't have judges without advisors, but the, ju the judges need advisors to be judged. So, so here we're speaking about, for example, judges like a Sanhedrin, where they themselves reached a level of knowledge and purity of, of, of spirit that their judgments are correct. That's, this, that's the premise is that, that the judges, the laws of the Torah and the proper rabbis and sages that represent those laws, they're beyond them. They don't have any personal agenda, so they're making true judgments. As we mentioned, that when the judges come to the right conclusions, so they become partners with God in creation. That's the type of judgment we mean. So just to clarify, obviously we don't mean uh, judges that make mistakes and that are coming up with wrong conclusions. That's not in this discussion. Um, in that case, okay, fine, you're right. That, that would be ready, a better way to say it is simple, lower level judges, like, like not, not every Orthodox rabbi can make his own decisions. Many times people, and this is a very important question you bring up, I'm going to elaborate on it now. Many times a person goes to his rabbi, and in his opinion of his rabbi is, his rabbi is amazing, his rabbi is holy, his rabbi knows everything, and it's not always the case. It's all according to the perspectives, meaning from where I stand, where I don't know anything, my rabbi knows everything, but where he stands, he realizes that there's another rabbi that knows much more than him, and so on and so on. So yes, you're right, and I'm glad you, you pressed this idea. Rabbis also need advisors, because they don't all, they're, not, they're not all qualified to judge in every matter. But once we reach the rabbis that are qualified, that's what we mean in the verse. The judges that we're appointing to be on the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the great court that's in the, in the Beit HaMikdash, and it will be soon, they are qualified to make legal rulings, and their rulings are binding. Okay, So we'll get to the answer. I, I, I think this is a very, very fascinating answer and a very, very encouraging answer. May we, may we hopefully we will appreciate it, is this. We have to look at the timing. Let's look at the timing a little bit now. The verses in the Torah were said and originally written while the Jews were in the desert. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, who, who's writing this command to have officers and judges, he knows that the Jewish people are going into Israel without him. Right? He knows that the Jews are not going to merit, and again, this is dealing with a bit of God's knowledge of the future versus our free will. We're not going to get into the issues, but we know at this point the, that we have to go into Israel and we had, did not merit to have Mashiach come while we were in the desert. There was a potential for the Jewish people to merit while in the desert when they received the Torah to merit Mashiach, to, to come and be the, the rabbi that brought us into Israel and then we would have lived forever without an evil inclination, without the same challenges that we know today and that didn't happen. And Moshe knew that and God knew that and that's why the Torah says that for right now when you're going to go into Israel and you're going to have to create a society 
and we still have an evil inclination within us, when we have within us the potential to do evil, so then we need officers. So in the time that this verse was written, judgment in a proper justice system would not function properly without police. Because we, don't, we wouldn't always listen to the judges. Just look at the scripture. How many times did a prophet of God tell us, God's not happy with what you're doing, change your ways, behave differently, did we listen? Look how many times over and over again we see that we didn't listen. We lost our first Beit HaMikdash because we didn't listen, our second Beit HaMikdash because we didn't listen enough, and all of the different fights and, 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 and times that our enemies defeat us, all because we didn't merit the divine protection that, that we were promised, because we didn't deserve it. So we see that throughout history, without police, certainly we would have never lived up to anywhere close to God's expectation. Even with the police, it's, seeming, it's arguably whether we succeeded or not. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. Okay, but, but, but let's look at what we're praying for now. Today, we are without a Bet HaMikdash, without a Sanhedrin, without a proper system of Jewish law. It's civil law, really, even in Israel. Civil law is what dictates, because they have police, they have guns, they have everything. Who listens to the rabbis today, even in Israel? Even in Jerusalem, the holy city of Hashem. The Beit is not the authority and the power, because they don't have police. But what are we praying for? In that Pro Shimon Esrei prayer, what are we praying for? We're praying that Mashiach should come speedily in our days. And when Mashiach does come, and Hashem does rebuild Jerusalem and Israel, and gives us back a Bet HaMikdash, and brings us back a Sanhedrin, and brings us back a real Jewish court with King Melech HaMashiach, when that time arrives and we are restored to that position, so guess what? At that time also, it says that the evil inclination within us will be destroyed, will be killed. We will no longer have the same evil inclination that we have inside of us. Our sole desire then will be to do what Hashem wants. So we won't need police officers in the future when Mashiach comes because we won't need to be forced to listen. We will we'll want to listen. But what will we need? We'll need good advice. In place of the officer that has to push us, compel us, threaten us, instead, in place of penalty and fear to motivate us to do the right thing, we will, we will want to do the right thing, but we'll want to know what's the best way I can serve Hashem. How's the best way that I can fulfill the laws and the rules of, ha of Hashem's Torah? So we'll need to go to someone to get good advice. I want to do the right thing, but is this the right thing or is this the right thing? Should I open up a business or should I work for some other business and then have my mind more free to learn. The advice, the etzah, that's what we're going to need. We're going to need judges to tell us what the laws are, what the rules are, what is the general path of Hashem. But within that general path, there are many particulars. And so we will need advice, personal advice that fits me to tell me how can I serve Hashem best? What does Hashem want from me? And that's the, in place of the officers. Now it comes out beautifully. The verse that the, the, that the rabbis used for our Shemona Esrei text is from the prophets talking to us about when Mashiach will come and Hashem will restore the Sanhedrin and we'll have proper judgment and we will only need, again, to get good advice. We won't need to be pushed, threatened to, to do the right thing. We will want to do the right thing anyway. This points to a, a nice idea which is just a bit of an extension of this. We have a bit of this idea of advice, advisors, even today before Mashiach. Because there are times when an individual wants to do what Hashem wants. Right? We, sometimes I want to do the right thing. I don't always need someone to yell at me and, and, and force me to do the right thing. I don't always need to be th threatened that I'm going to go to jail if I don't listen. Sometimes I want to do the right thing. And we have an opportunity to go to what we call Dat Torah. In, in Ashkenazi talk, Das Taira. We have an opportunity to go to a, a, a wise man. A man that is wise with Torah knowledge. Godly knowledge and ask him, what should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? And many ask, why should I go to a rabbi for business advice? What does he know about business? Why should I go to a rabbi to give me personal advice? Maybe I should go to a therapist. So the beautiful thing is that the rabbis that are very, very devoted to learning Torah reach a level of purity and holiness that they actually become a conduit for the divine will and wisdom. And when they speak, they're, they're revealing to us on some level what God really wants. It's godly advice coming through the wise man, through, through the rabbi. Not all rabbis can always going to do this correctly, but we see, like for example, in the Hasidic uh, movement, you have a, a rebbe, a very holy, a very wise man who takes responsibility for a large group of people and he advises them. There are a beautiful story, one that sticks out because it's a little bit of a, 
an unusual circumstance. Imagine going to the greatest rabbi, one of the greatest rabbis in America, and what's your big question? Rabbi, can you please tell me, I'm trying to decide what car to buy. Can you please give me car buying advice? What does the rabbi say? What do you want from me, rabbi? I'm, I'm a rabbi. Go ask a, go to a car go, go, go expert. It's not the answer he got. What was the answer he got? He got an answer from a truly wise man that understands a lot. And how did he know so much? From the Torah. From being an Eved Hashem, from being a servant of Hashem. And what was his answer? With all the suspense. His answer was to buy a new car at the end of the year where they offer you a rebate. For example, if Toyota, well, let's get fancy now. <laughs> We have all the money in the world. It's theoretical money. So we go to Rolls Royce. What's your favorite car? I think we'll go domestic. We'll be, we'll be patriotic. We'll take the new Corvette. It kind of looks cool. It looks Italian in design also anyway. So we'll take the new Corvette, or we can go to the Camaro, which is more of a muscle car. We'll go, Camaro, Corvette, whatever you want. The, or the, 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 what's that? Dodge makes also a nice car. Charger. I don't, okay, Charger doesn't sound smart. Charger. Whatever. They had the Viper. What, that's gone? Kids or whatever, whatever you, you fill in the blank, whatever car you want. My son has probably 20 cars that he want to put in there. But uh, so you, imagine you have the uh, 2022 Corvette, right? So now it's 2023 coming up. So what happens? Really, the industry forces the, the companies to make a new car every year because if you don't make a new car every year, people are not going to be as interested to buy a, a new a, buy car. So it's good for car business to have a new car every year. But, but, but what is that new car essentially? Right? What is this 20, 2023 Corvette? They try to tell you that they did some things differently to make you want it. But really, it's almost the same thing as the 22. So you have a brand new 2022 Corvette, and you have the same car that just says 20, 2023 on it. They're both new. But one is labeled 22, and one is labeled 23. So that one is rebate, has a rebate because it's a year old in value. So you're getting a brand new car, and you're getting it at the used car price. So that is what this, this sage answered the man. Go at the end of the year and buy the 20, 2022 car when it's really not much different than the 2023 car except for the $20,000 that you saved. And that's, that's smart. And of course, there are many other examples of questions that people ask. And we see sometimes the rabbis clearly have some type of divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh, in their answers. Reb Chaim, unbelievable story from Reb Chaim. By the way, the first story was from the Lubavitch Rebbe. Uh, this story is from Reb Chaim that recently passed away, Zecher Sadiq Levracha, on both of them. This story is unbelievable. There was a man that was in the middle of a court case. And uh, there was a, he, he owned a farm, and he had a, someone working in his farm. And that person, unfortunately, fell and was hurt when he fell. And he was suing the person for a lot of money because, it, unfortunately, he was hurt bad. This, no one wants this, but this was the situation. Now, the person came to Reb Chaim and said, listen, Reb Chaim, they're suing me for a lot of money. My insurance company said they'll cover the maximum, the maximum, but they want more. And they want to take my whole house and my farm. They want to take everything from me. I'll have nothing left. I didn't hurt the man on purpose. I, I, he was working, and they want everything from me. I'll be in, de I'll be in debt on top of that. And so Reb Chaim says, well, he says before this, he says, and I need to come now, my lawyer said, I need to make an offer. How much am I willing to give them above my insurance policy? And if I, otherwise the judge is going to make his own decision how much I have to give above. So Reb Chaim said, offer them a, a, an, extra, an extra shekel. It was in Israel. Offer them one shekel, which is a quarter, roughly a quarter. Offer them a quarter above your insurance policy. He says, what? You don't understand. This, this, that's, that, that's, they're going to take everything from me. They, they're not going to listen to a, a, an, an advice for a quarter. Reb Chaim said, I told, amati lecha, if you, I told you, ten lahem shekel, give them a shekel. And he actually goes looking in his pocket. He takes out his wallet. He starts looking for a shekel. And he, hand, he goes to hand him, and he goes, here, give them this shekel. And that's it. Not a penny more. And he said, look at the beautiful, he said, and even that shekel is too much. You could, you're going to come back and give me back the shekel. You, even that shekel is too much. You won't even need to give me the shekel. Give me back the shekel. 
And he said, this is insane. The guy's thinking, this is totally insane. But you know what? I have belief in Chachamim. Hashem speaks to us through who? Through the sages. Through the Chachamim. Like the God of Lador. The God of Lador is telling him, offer them a shekel. So he went, calls his lawyer. He says, so what's your offer? My offer is a shekel. Don't ask what the, the, the noise from the, what? Are you crazy? We've been dealing with this for two years. You want to give him everything? You want to lose everything? I said, a shekel. I spoke to Reb Chaim. He said, offer the shekel, and that's what I'm doing. He said, you're crazy, but I'm your lawyer. I can I'll do what you tell me. So he hangs up the phone, calls up the, the lawyer for the, for the person, unfortunately, that was hurt, and says, my client offers a shekel. Now, he screams <laughs> to the lawyer. I all the crazy. That's the offer. So the lawyer hangs up very, very upset, and he calls his client. And says to his client, listen, that guy's crazy. These people are crazy. We've been dealing with this case for years. I don't know what to tell you. Better just settle and that's it before you don't even get, who knows, you, you wait a year, you, didn't even get any, you may even see a penny. I don't even know when you're going to see a penny. Just settle. I think we should just settle and that's it. Get over with this craziness. And the guy agrees. So the lawyer calls back and says they settled for the insurance policy. Not a penny more. Unbelievable. So this man says, okay, unbelievable. I listened to Reb Chaim. The, the Ruach HaKodesh. He, what, whatever came out of his mouth, the words that came out of his mouth came to be. Tzadik gozer Hashem mekayem. When the Tzadik says, Hashem makes it happen. He came back with the shekel to give back to Reb Chaim. <laughs> Here's your shekel back. <laughs> the shekel you told me I'm going to give back to you. Then he stopped. He said, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I want to keep this shekel. It's like, why? <laughs> give, me, give me my shekel. It's my shekel. What do you want, what do you want my shekel for? Obviously, he didn't care about money. Because I want to keep this so I can show people that when you listen to the Chachamim, when you have faith in Hashem and His Torah and His leaders, look what happens. I want to show this to people. He said, if that's the case, keep it. And that's another example of who we have to turn to when we're confused, when we need advice. It's not always that the rabbis are there to yell at us to tell us what we have to do, what we need to do. There's a level we can reach, even before Mashiach comes, where we need the rabbis to tell me how to do it. How can I be the best I can be? We hold on to someone higher than us, and he pulls us up. That's what Moshe did for the people. Why was Moshe so important? Why do we need a Moshe? Because when Moshe is there and our focus is on him, he brings us all together and upward. He brings us all closer to Hashem. And that's what we're praying for. May we merit speedily, speedily in our days to see the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash, May we have Mashiach, King Mashiach, with us, Moshe Rabbeinu with us. May we have Hashem's rabbis, Hashem's advisors, Hashem's judges, and may they help bring us together and bring us closer and higher where we have the ultimate connection with Hashem and this world is connected to Hashem and we're literally going to be living heaven on earth, heaven on earth. May we see it speedily. Amen. 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 Okay. Sorry.